Good evening. You are tuned in to Political Prisoner Radio right here on the Black Talk Radio Network. Scotty Reed in for this broadcast from behind these enemy lines. Of course, y'all know I call it USA Inc. It is a um, today's date is actually December the 13th, 2015. I'm uh, glad that you could join us on those on this Sunday uh, night. Do have our co-host, of course, Sister Mija Whitlock. Riding shotgun with us. Uh, greetings to you this evening, Sister Whitlock. Greetings. So, um, you put you produced the program tonight, and I understand we're going to be talking about uh, NATO three, and there's an update on one of the prisoners' cases. Um, so, uh, we do have a couple of guests scheduled to uh, call into the program tonight. So, can you go ahead and give the listeners? A rundown on um, our guest tonight and what we'll be discussing. Sister Amija, are Hello? you there? Can you, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, we have uh, two speakers tonight. Um, our first speaker is Rachel um, Alshany. And um, Rachel served as uh, the librarian and press liaison for Occupy Chicago and was a protest organizer um, during uh, the NATO summit held in Chicago in May 2012. She's been actively supporting the NATO 3, arrested on um, various different types of charges days before the summit and other political prisoners since that time. Um, our second guest is um, Amanda Schmecki. Um, Amanda Schmecki, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly, is a staff attorney with the Civil Liberties Defense Center. Uh, she received her JD from Seattle University School of Law and MS in writing and book publishing from Portland State University. Amanda decided to become attorney because of her experiences in the animal liberation movement through which she saw a need for legal support that is grounded in solidarity and resistance. She has traveled throughout the country to work with grassroots communities that are fighting to protect the earth and its inhabitants. And before we and, uh, get started, I do think we uh, have one of our scheduled guests on the line, but before we get started, uh, the phone network is down for the free conference call, um, so we apologize to those who usually uh, call in through that system. So we will only uh, be able to use uh, our studio lines tonight, which is 704-951-5030. Unfortunately, we can't allow people to hang out on the line as it drains uh, computer resources. And uh, But we do want to apologize. Wasn't able to connect. I'll perhaps try to later, but I really don't want to. Uh, but also want to uh, give a shout out to the new network that we're uh, – now I'm broadcasting and doing our video cast through, and that's blab.im. I really like the platform and uh, looking forward to incorporating it into our regular programming through blacktalkradionetwork.com. And of course, Political Prisoner Radio, which you're listening to right now, is a big part of that. But I do believe we have our guest, uh, one of our uh, scheduled guests on the line. We just have had someone call in from the area code 773. Uh, who do we have on the line? Uh, this is Rachel. Greetings to you, Rachel. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, we don't want to waste any time. So, Sister Amija, would you like to uh, lead us in this interview with Rachel? Sure. Um, Rachel, um, can you just give us um, a little background of uh, yourself and how you got involved um, in the work around uh, the NATO summit and, you know, I guess started off, started off at kind of like that point. Okay. Yeah. So the NATO summit, um, you know, I was one of the organizers with Occupy Chicago and I was actually running the library that we had of donated books. So when we had all these activists coming in from out of town, I was one of the people who was kind of welcoming them, trying to get them set up with a place to stay and, you know, all of that. 
Um, so the film in itself was obviously very intense. Um, and there was, we had a whole 10 days of action leading up to the summit. So there was a lot going on. Um, but in all of that, there was a big raid on one of the apartments where a lot of people were staying from out of town. Um, and three, well, actually five people were arrested in that raid and, um, held on terrorism charges. Um, and what had happened, which we sorted out later, was we had two undercover Chicago Police Department officers, um, you know, who had been attending all our meetings, all our actions, and had infiltrated Occupy, and they um, befriended these out-of-town activists you know, the, the NATO three, as we call them, are three guys who came in from Florida. Um, and then the other two were actually living in Chicago and had a separate case. Um, but the NATO three themselves had come, they road tripped from Florida. They had been part of Occupy Miami, Occupy Fort Lauderdale, you know, all the Florida ones. Um, and they just came a few weeks early to hang out. And, uh, you know, see what we're up to. They joined our local actions. They've been, they've been occupying a mental health clinic that had been closed by the city. Um, and they showed up there. Um, but unfortunately, they got to know the cops who were infiltrating our movement. Um, and so the, they recorded a lot of our conversations. They, you know, tried to build a case that we were you know, these guys were here to be violent. Um, they, you know, they convinced, what ultimately ended up happening is they convinced them to put together three Molotov cocktails, which consisted of gasoline poured into beer bottles and a ripped up bandana. And that was the charge of terrorism for those, you know. Sort of what we, I I don't mean to interrupt, (laughs) but sort of what we saw, uh, some of the photographs and imagery coming out of Ferguson, you know, as many frustrated people down down there. So we're not talking about, you know, constructing some kind of suitcase bomb to, you know, blow up a whole bunch of people. Right. You know, at the most, like, a lot of can cause some destruction, but it's not. It's not a Boston Marathon bombing. Like, you know, it's not mass, you know, casualties or anything like that. Uh, plus, plus it was the cops who came up with the idea and got all the ingredients and basically put it together. <laughs> um, so, the, so those guys, um, stuck it out and went to trial and they actually were acquitted of the terrorism charges, which, you know, Usually, uh, there have not been too many terrorism acquittals in this country since 9-11. Um, they, they did still pick up a few felonies for possession of an incendiary device and, you know, intent to use an incendiary device and all that. Um, and some mob action was in there. Um, so they still got some time, but the most serious charges um, the jury looked at it and said, no. Do you know why uh, so, the jury looked, um, decided the way that it did? Did the fact that, and I don't know if it came out during the trial, but this is standard operating procedure for the FBI on a lot of these terrorism charges where you have informants and that's how they make a living is feeding information to the police and law enforcement. And then they go out and, I mean, there's been a number of other cases. Um, I think yeah. some cases of some homeless um, people coming out of Miami and then, you know, it's the informant who's the ring leader and, and, and then, you know, uh, so it's the FBI that's really initiating the plot. So you were yeah. going to Yeah, so the interesting so. thing in this case is actually that it was local. So they weren't charged with federal terrorism, but they were charged under an Illinois terrorism law, Local. which had not ever really been used. Okay, gotcha. Um, it, like, it was put on the books after 9-11, you know, out of all the fear-mongering. But the, what, what's interesting is the FBI actually did not want to prosecute them. They looked at them and they said, we don't see them as a threat, 
into the state circuit. Um, but they use they use very similar tactics to what we've seen the FBI do, where they, you know, infiltrate. Um, they're undercover. They make friends with, you know, someone who's kind of at the fringe. They were from out of town. They didn't really know, you know, who was legit and who wasn't. Um, and yeah, and then they start suggesting, you know, trying to push them like more and more radical and doing things they wouldn't have necessarily considered on their own. Sister Meech, are you still there? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm here. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, is there still an echo on the line? Oh, uh, no. It's, uh, um, you sound fine now. Okay. Yeah, I was told that there was some kind of echo on the line. Um, so now I'm told this was a state case and not federal, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So is it still a state case or is it a federal case? It's a state case. It never went to federal court. Okay. Because what we're actually seeing in Baltimore um, regarding people who um, are accused of doing um, specific things during the uprising um, and our rebellion, um, we're actually, um, we're seeing those cases that would be like misdemeanors or uh, something like a arson or the cutting of like fire hoses. We're seeing those cases now move out of state court and they're being prosecuted on, on the federal level. Wow. And for the listeners that don't um, know what Sister Meadows referring to um, when she says the uprising, Baltimore uprising, Baltimore rebellion, she's talking about um, the aftermath of the killing of Freddie Gray. Right. And we're actually like moving into the second phase right now where the police officers are being tried and uh, one of the officers will have a verdict sometime um, this week between Monday and Thursday. Um, yesterday, tomorrow they're going to be like at the end of closing arguments. Um, so we really don't know um, what to expect. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at like these specific cases here in Baltimore, you know, and looking at how um, we're looking at a new set of political prisoners, um, as well as there was an activist and organizer in Ferguson um, who was hit with um, some arson charges, and uh, a young man by the name of Josh, who was accused of uh, setting fire to uh, that quick, quick mark, and they gave him um, eight years. Uh, um, on well, the same day that it was announced that a young man here in Baltimore, Greg Butler, who was accused of cutting a fire hose, um, that it was the same day that we heard that his case was going to be moved into the federal court system. Um, so, I mean, just a lot of like similar, you know, tactics here. Um, even now, like as we move into like this different phase of uh, the rebellion now that the police are having their trials, they even came up with a bogus permit to like stop us from trying to like protest in front of the courthouse. And they put out like a new spy cam. You know, so we there's a camera on the extension pole that's now being powered by uh, solar cells um, that's being used right in the center of the street to spy on, you know, any activist or organizer that, you know, comes over in that area to protest. Um, so yeah, I mean, what you're saying is like p specific, you know, police tactics, infiltration, um, you know, entrapment and, you know, many other things that, you know, are entrapment specific tactics the that are taking place across the country. For. Yeah, that's a good word to use. It is entrapment. And, and some other cases, um, some people have been found innocent, but we, we see that a lot whenever, you know, um, um, like the CEO of America, the, whoever the president is, says that, you know, we stop all of these plots. And, and usually they are the ones, uh, uh, FBI informants are initiating the plots. If we look at what happened, like with a lot of people that say Guantanamo Bay, I've been hearing people joke about that. And, and you know, it's just really sad. Um, and people in Guantanamo Bay were are there because, you know, the uh, CIA was paying bounties. 
you know, and people's neighbors or I didn't like you or whatever, you know, and turn you in and make these false allegations. And then, you know, 10, eight years, um, eight, 10, 15 years of your life is gone. And and so um, I think, you know, we do need to acknowledge more that this is going on on a more nationalized and local level. You know, and even if it's not federal charges, well, you know, it, the state charges, what, what are the members of the NATO three, you know, some of the most serious um, um, sentences that they are looking at? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's why we need to talk about it, um, because when I was doing support for these guys, I was completely new to it. I think we need to kind of help you know, these new political prisoners are being created, find a way to maybe network um, and talk about previous cases and what can we do um, to try to, you know, stay strong against these tactics. Um, but I also want to point out, like, they need to fabricate terrorists to stop so that they look like they're being effective in doing things and also so they look like the protesters are you know, out of control and need to be put down or whatever. Um, but I, I want to point out that the same, you know, the, the NATO free case was prosecuted by the Illinois State's attorney, Anita Alvarez, who's the same one who sat on the video of a Chicago police officer murdering a teenage boy um, a little over a year ago. And so that video has just been released and a where our current protest here in Chicago has been surrounding and people have been calling for her resignation. But just the fact that she would build this extreme case against three guys who came, you know, just to protest and oppose NATO. Um, but then she would sit on this case of like clear violence against. The young man you know, you're talking about is Laquan McDonald, 17 Laquan, year old Laquan yeah. McDonald. And, um, let me tell you, Anita Alvarez has been in uh, um, that same position for over 30 years. Um, that overlaps the time when John Burge there, the former uh, Chicago police uh, captain who was um, uh, found to have been running a torture ring. I know there, uh, Mark Clements, one of uh, the victims of John Burge and, you know, a wrongfully uh, convicted person who's now on the outside working to free the others. And there's like um, hundreds uh, of people in there. Al Alvarez was the prosecutor at that time, and she was behind a lot of those convictions. And that's why now, as they want new trials, as it's just all coming out, um, you know, uh, even two Chicago cops were just being prosecuted, according to a report by uh, Mr. Clements out of Chicago. They were, you know, in a trial about an uh, individual they had tortured. But Anita Alvarez has been there for over 30 years uh, helping them to cover up these type of crimes. You don't, you know, I'm pretty sure the hundreds of victims of the Chicago police that, you know, were tortured into confessing uh, probably told somebody in the prosecutor's office something at one point that I really didn't do this, but this is the type of individual uh, a well entrenched uh, cog in the system, and she she actually needs to do more than just step down. I think she should be prosecuted, but you know um, that's wishful thinking there. But I still think if we lived in a system based on justice, she would be facing prosecution for her. just a you know we could uh, say that on the Laquan McDonald murder. She's a conspiracy to just sit there and let that guy sit for a year on a desk duty job, and she only. Uh, filed murder charges on him after journalists forced the video uh, to come out. So I, I don't mean to be long-winded, but that's Anita Alvarez. She has a very long history of corruption and criminality. Right, and so does um, the Chicago Police Department. And we only have to like look back at you know the police and the FBI uh, murder of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. You know, under the dailies, uh, under the dailies. You know, um, there's a long history of uh, this type of corruption and uh, multi-layer uh, spying on activists and organizers um, in Chicago. Um, not that it doesn't exist in other places, you know, it's just well documented in Chicago. And now we even have uh, the, that black spot, uh, that black site up there. 
um, that people have been uh, talking about uh, quite square. often. Mm -hmm. um, so um, recently, Rachel, um, I came across information that um, Jared specifically out of the NATO three uh, was having uh, was supposed to have a court hearing, but then it was also made known that um, he had had a visible, um, you know, looked like he had had a, a visible, um, I guess, how can I put it, um, that apparently the correctional officers may have, uh, you know, done something to him um, physically oh, so and that he him. appeared. Is that the word you're looking for? What did you say, Scotty? <laughs> I said assault. <laughs> yes, yes, assault. So it appeared that he had been assaulted uh, recently. And, um, you know, I was just really concerned overall regarding um, information about his case and uh, worried about um, his health. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so first of all, he... Um, of all of the three, they each got slightly different sentences, and he was the one who got the longest sentence to begin with. Um, he got eight years, which in Illinois you can serve half of that. Half of that. Um, so it would be four years, and it includes pre trial confinement. So we're actually coming up to when his original release date would have been for, just for the NATO 3 trial. Um, so that would be May of 2016 that he would get out. However, while he was in Cook County Jail, which is one of the worst facilities in the country, and of course that's, that's hard to even say because they're all horrifying. <laughs> but um, so he was in Cook County Jail, and he um, is being accused of assaulting a correctional officer by throwing urine and feces out of his cell, which is, if anyone has actually done prisoner support or correspond with a prisoner, it's actually a pretty common thing that prisoners do, especially when they have no power when they're not being listened to. In his case, he was not getting medical attention he needed. Um, it's literally the the only weapon they have. Can you say that again? You said he was, um, his reason for his, uh, what I would call political demonstration, resistance <laughs> to the system of slavery that still exists. Uh, um, you said they were denying him medical attention because we see that a lot nationwide in the, you know, prison, regardless of the prisoner's political status. Yeah, and in this case, it's extremely serious. He has Huntington's disease, which is actually um, what killed his father at a pretty young age. And once the degenerative nature of the disease takes over, you only have a few more years um, of useful life. And then beyond that, you know, you can be, in, you know, basically around the clock medical care. You can stay alive for a few more years. But you know, he's basically got a very short lifespan ahead of him, and that's if he receives treatment. He's not being given treatment in, in custody. Um, so, in this fight, so, ever since. so this yeah. also, again, underscores the importance of Momia Abu-Jamal's case right now um, against um, the um, Pennsylvania uh, Department of Corrections uh, for denying him treatment to uh, for his help C that he contracted while you know through the system and then help C being you know a, a pretty uh, serious uh, communicable disease that's that some say are have already re reached epidemic levels uh, throughout the prisons throughout so you know that's a denial of health care which is a human right um, again, these people are being treated like slaves under the 13th Amendment. They don't have no rights. That's what's being said. This is denial. Denial of medical services. If health care, like the Democrats say, you know, is a is a right, uh, then what about denying someone uh, health care? You know, and these and, and prisoners, regardless of why they're in the custody of the state or uh, the federal government or uh, county jail. You know, they have human rights and, and they never lose those. 
And, and so I just think that, that again, Mumia's case, which is being argued right now, is very important, and whether it will set a precedence to where they cannot deny people, um, you know, uh, access to life saver medical treatment. Yeah, um, and you know, it, the the disease makes him very erratic. His behavior when it, you know, when it's not being controlled, when he's not getting the medication and the diet that he needs, he, you know, he has a lot of spasms, like, his, you know, his muscles move his body around without his control. Um, and their response to that is always to shackle him tighter, which is not, you know, going to help, but they don't want anything that's out of control. They, you know, they need to keep him in control, so they're always shackling him, and, you know, basically without treatment, his behavior and all that is going to get only worse. So they're considering it assault, that he, you know, squirted stuff out of his cell towards an officer. Um, in the meantime, at his most recent court date, again, there were signs of actual assault, um, where he had a black eye and his face was bruised. Uh, so I don't know the details of how that happened. I'm hoping, you know, I'm gonna, I sent him a letter. I'm going to hope that he can get one through to me. Um, then maybe he can explain it more. But, you know, we know that he's being mistreated definitely by denial of medical um, treatment, but also, you know, it seems like there was some kind of physical complication. Well, we need to take a, a um, quick station identification uh, break, and um, we will be back on the other side. And uh, we are scheduled to have a second guest uh, join us later in the broadcast. But if you have a question or a comment about the case of the NATO 3, um, if you have uh, any observations, things that you want to share on air, give us a call at our studio line, 704-951-5030, 704 and you can also chime in uh, through via video chat, and uh, we'll open up your mic there, and you'll be able to uh, ask our guest tonight our question. We'll be back on the other side. Stay tuned. Body, they can do anything they want to do. We might not be back. I might be in jail. I might be anywhere. But when I leave, you remember I said the last words on my lips. I am a revolutionary. And I will never be the same. 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 Never be the you are tuned in to the Black Talk Radio Network. And welcome back. You're listening to Political Prisoner Radio. We air every Sunday night at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time right here on Black Talk Radio Network.com, which is New Black Media for the New millennium and um so ladies please please continue and i think we are being joined uh by our second guest eric cole 425 uh, who do we have on the line uh give me just a second i'm sorry i had the mics muted uh, uh again area code uh 425 hello yes welcome to political prisoner radio who do we have on the line Hey, this is Amanda Shemke. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, so, Sister Omija, if you'll take over. Right. Um, before we um, get to Amanda, I just wanted to uh, point out that Anita, Anita Alvarez also prosecuted uh, the Tenley Park Five as well as uh, Jason Hammond. Um, and I just wanted, I guess, to uh, wrap up um, our portion of the show with the NATO Three. Um, Rachel, can you um, tell us how we can uh, help uh, Jared and uh, the other members of uh, the NATO 3? Yeah, the easiest way to help Jared right now is to just write him a letter. Um, he's at Pontiac Correctional Center. You can search Jared Chase, but I also the, saw that the information will be posted on your website. Um, 
So just a letter, a card, you know, something to let him know that people haven't forgotten about him. We also have a link up to a wish list of books that he wants. He's mostly in solitary. So books are the only thing for him to do to pass the time. Um, beyond that, the other the other two guys are actually out on parole now and um, generally doing pretty well. Um, all things considered, they're still readjusting. Um, but yeah, our main focus right now is on getting Jared through to the end of his first sentence and through this next trial for that assault charge. And that trial, when does that trial come up? Right now, it's scheduled for April 11th. That's another court date, um, February 3rd, in advance of the trial. It's been pushed back many times, but I'm assuming with his release date coming up, they will try to have it in April. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and you have a good evening. You too. Hello. 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 Hi, Amanda. How are you? Hi. Good. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, so we gave a small introduction um, earlier, um, a little bit about uh, your history. Can you um, tell us how you got involved in uh, animal liberation and, uh, you know, defending the earth? Uh, as well as, you know, some of the cases around the different political prisoners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, grew up caring a lot about animals. And when I was in college, I got into doing animal rights activism. And then through doing that, I was getting to know a lot of people in the animal rights and liberation movement who had different court cases going on. And they had but lawyers often who didn't understand the political context of those cases. Um, and so I decided to go to law school because I wanted to be able to um, use my background of being an activist as well as uh, being a lawyer to be able to represent activists in a way that has an understanding of the political context and with a lot of sympathy towards um, working for animals and trying to protect the earth. Mm -hmm. So, can you um, give us a little background on, I guess, uh, Kevin and Tyler's case and, you know, what, because we've actually done a show previously on, um, you know, the Animal Enterprise Terrorist Act, um, and it was a really good show, um, and I don't remember, do you remember when we did that, Scotty? Uh, where we had just, yeah, you know, talked about year. it, and then we got into a little bit of Kevin and Taylor's cases. Yeah, um, cases. and we mentioned it also on our other program, New Abolitionist Radio, which focuses on 21st century slavery and human trafficking, and um, how we were starting to see this law, like many laws and statutes they've passed, be misapplied. And to, you know, put serious uh, charges against someone and, and saying this is a think about this. Think about this. And, and excuse me for my men, mental brain freeze. What, what's what's our uh, political prisoners we're talking about now that were charged under the Animal Terrorism Act? Uh, Kevin and um, Tyler. Yes, Kevin and Tyler. Now think about Kevin and Tyler being charged under that. They, they um, view setting animals free as an act of terrorism and they had you know in this you know law was actually proposed by corporations you know that use animals for testing and stuff like that that's again like the private prison industry uh sponsoring legislation and getting it passed like three strikes out and, and all that so that's this is a a, a terrorism uh statute that's on the books that came about by those corp uh corp corporations now think about they've been charged with that and that's an act of terrorism right okay it's being called an act of terrorism by our government recognized by all now think about the uh four individuals uh i don't you know i haven't memorized their names yet that uh shot five of the minneapolis uh precinct shut down four precinct shut down uh shot five of the peaceful demonstrations in 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 those four individuals 
who posted a video waving a gun and making, you know, racist, um, um, intimating uh, racist thoughts and whatnot. Um, and um, they're not charged. They're charged with like second degree assault and state charges. That's the most serious charge they're looking at. So I just want people to think about the absurdity of this law and how it's being used and how it's victimizing people. Yeah, so that's definitely, I mean, Kevin and Tyler were indicted under the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, and as you just mentioned, it's the ATA was devised largely by ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, um, which they basically write model legislation and pass it off to Congress to then pass it into law. And it is a big corporation to make a lot of money off of exploiting animals who wrote this law. And so um, that's the background of it. And so it's very much intended to try to chill activism. I mean, they put the word terrorism in there. Um, and it clearly has that motivation to be directed at activists. But something that is also important to consider with it is that it's really only been used against a small handful of activists. Um, and it really is in place more to try and scare people, to make people afraid to even get involved in activism. And so something that we all need to do is to demystify this, make sure we are explaining the people the motivation behind it. And since the motivation behind it is to try and scare us out of doing stuff, then no, Which is an act of terrorism. To continue working for animals. To me, that's an act of terrorism. If it's the definition, and I've said this on earlier uh, broadcast about you know the whole prosecution of, of of the drug war. You know, if you look up the most accepted definition of terrorism, if you want to go to a dictionary, okay, is when you use fear. Uh, intimidation and violence to push a, a political agenda. Well, what is the drug war if not a political agenda where police are using fear, intimidation, and violence to get people to enforce this law? Uh, uh, people are actually uh, being killed. And so, like you just mentioned, the pastors of this legislature put fear. This is fear tactics and intimidation. And, you know, they make examples of people and to me to push a political agenda. Uh, and, and so, it, to me, if it's the definition of an act of terrorism, mm -hmm. state-sponsored uh, terrorism. But I digress. Uh, please continue. Yeah, I mean, you can look at Tyler and Kevin's case to see how absurd it is there to animal rights activists who um, are, they put, they sort of give a little information about the status of their case. They both took non-cooperating plea deals and they did plead guilty to violating the ATA. And what they um, were, were accused of doing was freeing 2, 000, about 2,000 meat from a fur farm um, and destroying breeding cards at the fur farm so that the meat that they were able to recover had no value to be sold um, in the fur industry and writing liberation is love on the side of a building at the fur farm. Um, so it was, you know, clearly, you know, people acting to give animals a chance at life and not to just be killed for the fur industry. Um, and for that, they were, you know, indicted as terrorists. Um, so that's where they're at right now with stuff. And they are awaiting sentencing now in 2016. Um, they could get up to five years of a sentence, but it'll, um, so it'll probably be between two to five years for future some. So they are, are they still currently incarcerated out on bail? Um, where, you know, I guess like where are they like in, in this process? Uh, do they have yeah. a, you yeah. said there's a court date coming up? Mm -hmm. Um, so Tyler is, currently out. He is restricted to being in a certain area of Southern California um, while he awaits his sentencing. Um, and Kevin has been in custody um, for the last couple of years um, awaiting the sentencing. Um, so support for him is extra important right now. 
um, there is a support website. It's supportkevinandtyler.com. And if you go on there, you can see information about sending letters, sending books, um, as well as making donations, which is super important, um, especially um, looking towards their sentencing and both of them being um, in prison. Okay, I didn't have any more questions. Uh, Sister Major, do you have any more? Um, I guess my, um, I guess my last question would be, um, you know, how, you know, how are they, you know, health wise as we were, you know, talking about, you know, Jared's health, you know, earlier and a lot of the other political prisoners having, you know, very different health concerns. Um, you know, how are the two of them, you know, holding up actually being, you know, some of the younger, um, political prisoners? Um, and some of the newer, um, yeah, you know, do we have like any, good? Oh, sorry, I was just going to say since Tyler is out, he is, um, able to take care of himself in more ways than people who are incarcerated. Um, he is trying to do that as much as he can. He's, uh, doing competitive cycling and trying to, and focus on other areas of his life. And Kevin, um, he's doing okay right now. Um, obviously, he's awaiting something, so that carries stresses with it. But he's also doing okay. Um, and he appreciates hearing from people and hearing about what people are doing and what's going on. So um, letters are great for that and keeping his spirits up. Right. I think that's, you know, always important, you know, for, you know, that external support, you know, from the outside for the community to, you know, write letters and stay in touch, you know, with Definitely. our PPs, especially, you know, especially this time of year, you know, although I don't celebrate specific holidays, you know, um, and I may not know the you know, uh, perspectives of some of the political prisoners, but specifically, you know, this time of the year, regardless of what, whatever people's beliefs are, you know, generally that time of the year when families do have, you know, downtime away from being, you know, uh, the average, uh, wage slave, um, in this country. And, you know, there's that time of year when some people, you know, do get pressed, depressed and they do get, you know, a little bit more lonelier. So I definitely would, you know, encourage all of our listeners to, you know, reach out to, you know, our political prisoners, write them, you know, write them a letter, send them cards, you know, let them know that, like, that, that they're not forgotten during this time of the year. If you could get the website out once again. Uh, for them, it's supportkevinandtyler.com. And there's also a Facebook page. So people can look at both of those to look at how to write letters, how to send books, how to make donations, find out more information about the case, um, as well as we'll post updates, um, especially as the sentencing is approaching to keep people updated on what kinds of support they want surrounding that and then in the time following that. Did you have any clarity? Uh, Amanda, I have one question. Okay. Um, are they, if they're being prosecuted under, um, this uh, Animal Enterprise Act. So they're they're federal prisoners, right? They're not on the state side. They're federal, yes. They already, okay. when they were originally arrested, it was on state charges, and they both already served their time for that. And then they were a year later indicted on the federal ATA charges. Okay. Did you have any uh, closing thoughts? Um, about political prisoners in general or anything uh, specific that you would like to uh, leave with like our If listeners. they're being prosecuted. Uh, I, was, I couldn't hear all of that. If that was happening. Uh, we had some feedback there. Apologies for that. Um, no, I was asking, did you have any final thoughts uh, about political prisoners? Because a lot of people... Um, in the general population of people or the masses in this country, uh, they don't even know that political prisoners exist. And that, you know, that right there just shows, you know, that there is a information deficit about what's really going on across this land. 
Um, so did you have any closing thoughts uh, with that in mind and share any other information you would like to in closing? Yeah, I mean, as, I mean a, a, probably a big point of this show even is to, to support people who are in prison and make sure that they never feel forgotten to do what we can to make them still feel like they're part of the community and that, you know, as much as prisons put up walls to try and do what we can to break that down and reach across it and make sure people know that we're thinking about them and doing what we can to take care of them and to also remember that when we're engaging in political resistance movement state repression is going to be a reaction to that and so we have to acknowledge that as long as you know we're fighting back against corporations and governments um, that we're going to experience repression and then that's going to mean that we have political prisoners and so we need to organize in ways that always include being able to do support for people and take care of people. Thank you for joining us tonight and you have a good evening. Oh, Sister Omija, um, did you have any final thoughts? I know I got some final thoughts. I mean, not final thoughts as in our final thoughts for tonight's program, but on the uh, issues that were brought up during our uh, two interviews. And thank you uh, for producing a great program tonight filled with information. But, you know, we didn't really talk as much about um, NATO and why they're called the NATO three and what was going on at, at the time. And, and then, so I want people to think about who NATO is and what NATO has done and what NATO is doing. Um, you know, we are a conscious black radio network and we know, um, you know, that there is uh, information that is being suppressed and, or, you know, it's pretty much common knowledge, but, um, no one seems to find um, it to be problematic that you got a candidate for president who, when she was the secretary of state, uh, betrayed a um, um, ally of the United States government. I'm talking about the Libyan government um, at the time, especially an ally in the quote unquote so-called uh, war on t terror. But she stood in a, in a Libyan town, I think it was Tripoli, and said, we can't wait till we capture and kill you. This is a prime minister, right? A sitting head of state, which is, that's illegal against uh, U.S. law. See, they, they, they prosecute us uh, with these silly laws that they write. Uh, but then when there's real crime at the highest level, it gets ignored and people just worried about, um, you know, her email. But NATO, NATO is, is the military power that overthrew uh, Libya's legitimate government and then stood by why, while uh, these CIA assets calling themselves, you know, uh, ISIL or, or whatnot, and, you know, allow them to just go on a killing spree, a mass killing spree across Libya. And, and so, you know, uh, there is plenty of things I can understand why a whole lot of people would be against NATO and would de demonstrate uh, against NATO, which is how this all uh, um came about is through a demonstration in Chicago against NATO, right? Right. Right. So that, right. And basically, yeah. you know, NATO is, you know, a, an alliance of various different, you know, world powers, um, a large, uh, you know, global um, uh, criminals. And, um, you know, these protesters and um you know, folks from across the country and around the world. Because, I mean, there's been multiple um, NATO summits. There was a NATO summit in, um, you know, Toronto before there was a NATO summit in um, Chicago. Um, but these are, you know, global global gangsters that um, are engaged in, you know, uh, various different types of criminal acts uh, against the people, destabilization, destabilizing countries, like they you know, in Syria um, right causing now. wars. Mm -hmm. We see that in, in Syria with NATO partner, partner Turkey. Um, and I was reading some right. uh, intelligence information. It's pretty much the U.S. State Department through back channels has confirmed that Turkey has been a lot helping so-called ISIL uh, sale the stolen oil and that's how they're funding uh, there but I don't want to go we don't have that much time left for me to even go into just how phony uh, that so-called war uh, is there but Turkey is allowing 
you know, whoever it is, the CIA assets or, you know, actually actual jihadis selling this stolen oil. Um, so um, that's NATO. That's a NATO partner. Turkey's a NATO partner. And um, NATO, it seems to me, is more concerned about uh, regime change, just like they did in Libya. They want to see the same thing in Syria instead of fighting against the quote unquote terrorists. So those are those are my thoughts. Um, did you have right. any final thoughts as we get ready to wrap it up? And uh, before we close out, uh, before and, and before you get your final thoughts, uh, political prisoner birthdays. We do want to acknowledge the political prisoner birthdays. Uh, let's see, on December the 15th, Fred Burton um, will have a birthday. Um, Chelsea Manning will have a birthday on December the 17th. And then Connor Stevens will have also a birthday on December the 17th. So that's three political prisoner birthdays uh, this week. You can check the political uh, prisoner and prisoner war birthday calendar at nycabc.wordpress.com. Uh, sis, uh, before I said that, you were about to speak and uh, also give us some of your closing thoughts. Yeah, I was just going to um, <laughs> I was gonna bring up the birthdays as well. Um, but I was just doing, um, you know, a quick search on um, some of the recent, um, you know, information happening with NATO. But... There's uh, thousands of people um, gathered in uh, Montenegro capital to protest uh, NATO membership. Um, and this is via uh, RT on uh, December 13th. Um, and this was like short, shortly after Montenegro's bid to join the North Atlantic Alliance was given a green light. Thousands flooded the street of the capital to protest the upcoming membership and remind people of lives taken during the NATO invasion of 1999. And have we, have you heard anything recently about um, the move for the kingdom of Hawaii to get its uh, independence back? Um, or, you know, it's, it's still the same thing. The Supreme court is holding it up, turning it back to the lower court course. Uh, have you heard anything recent on that? I haven't seen anything. No, I haven't um, heard anything recent. Just the same, the same thing. All right. Well, we do want to invite you, if you're on social media on Facebook, to follow our so social uh, media page, which is Political Prisoner Radio. Again, this is a weekly program that comes on every um, Sunday night at nine o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Um, tonight we had a couple of guests. That's why I did not prepare a political prisoner. A radio mix, of course, using some of the clips from prisonradio.org, uh, which uh, helps bring the voices of some of our political prisoners and prisoners of war from behind the prison walls. But I will post one to Political Prisoner Radio Facebook page. So there's a reason for you to not only like the page, but sign up to get notifications as well. So you can catch that next Political Prisoner Radio mix. And uh, until next week, and of course, we also share. Uh, information uh, daily about different events happening around the country on behalf of political prisoners and prisoners of war. Uh, again, it's um, been an um, uh, informative program. Um, just want people to recognize the fact something that Sister Mijo has said, you know, a lot of political prisoners are being made today in today's uh, current protest movement. And so it's always important to recognize political prisoners because it could be you. It could be you behind there. It could be your son. It could be your daughter. Um, as people, it seems, are we are coming into a mass awakening or, you know, uh, just a little bit uh, higher percentages of the masses starting to wake up. And uh, many of them are turning out uh, in the street and through other uh, ways to make their voices uh, heard and to try to have an impact on the issues that they care about. So, you know, it, it, anybody can become a political prisoner. Uh, new ones are being made every day, but it also we have to keep especially in mind uh, our political prisoners who are elders now, you know, because that's the plan all along is for them to die in prison, and many of them are, in fact, uh, innocent. So that's our program for tonight. Uh, join us again next week. Coming up at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, barring any technical issues, as I understand that conference line may still be down. 
Uh, we'll see how we'll work that out. But the Lotus Place is coming on at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time on the digital radio station, blacktalkradionetwork.com. Of course, you can access the station at blacktalkradionetwork.com. Uh, also, if you're on TuneIn, you can uh, follow us there. Until next week, peace and blessings to all. You know, we do whatever we do. Drop it.